Well, this World Cup continues to deliver on surprises, doesn't it? Just because you upset one of the biggest teams in the world, one of the strongest at the tournament, does not mean you are safe in your next game. You reset the board and take it one game at a time. Anyways, enough from uh, Coach Adrian there. <laughs> How are you guys? Are you enjoying the tournament so far? Let's get into today's matches, Sunday's matches. And if you're new here and you're looking for a community to join, to take in the World Cup together, then why not subscribe? Join us. All right, let's go. Japan versus Costa Rica. I have no idea what happened in this game. I have no idea how Japan could go from how they performed against Germany to how they performed against Costa Rica. And all the same, I have no idea how Costa Rica went from their 7-0 drubbing into beating Japan 1-0. Perhaps Moriyasu thought this match was going to be a cakewalk because, I mean, the lineup that he put out there for this game was changed quite a bit. No Maeda or Ito to start the hero Asano coming off of the bench as well again. They were having a really difficult time breaking down Costa Rica and generating genuine chances out there against Costa Rica's incredibly defensive 5-4-1 formation. All hands on deck for Costa Rica. What was worrying for Japan was that one of their defensive midfielders in Endo was getting all of the genuine opportunities, or the best opportunities, I should say. They were consistently falling to the wrong guy, which says a lot about how the attackers were struggling for Japan in this game. In the end, it was Costa Rica's Fuller who would open the scoring in the 81st minute, a sloppy turnover by Japan just outside of their 18. Tahala rolls the ball to Fuller, and he hits a looping strike that Japanese keeper Gonda gets a hand on and probably should have saved, to be honest, but it still floats past him and in. Bit of a weak wrist there. 1-0 Costa Rica, they get the massive win and they blew Group E wide open before Germany and Spain even played their match later in the day. A win for Germany and this group would be the most even one yet. But what happened? Germany versus Spain, Spain looked good the last time these two faced each other and they certainly looked great early doors in this match. Gavi, the catalyst of Spain, were on the front foot, while Dani Olmo hit an absolute asteroid toward Manuel Neuer, who could only palm the ball off the bar. Germany were absolutely chasing shadows against Spain in that first half, who had a young front line that was far too dynamic for the Germans at that point. But a surging run from Goretzka in the 10th minute saw him play Gnabry through and force Simon out of his goal. It was offside in the end, but signs of life from Germany at least. Signs of being able to break down the Spanish defense. It became much more even from then on, with both sides just oozing quality in the attack. However, Spain probably should have been leading, but for a massive tackle from Musiala, the two best chances fell to Spain in the first half, and another from Ferran that he put over the bar after a great ball from Omo, but it was called back for offside anyway. Pique Torres. <laughs> and yeah, I know he scored against Costa Rica, but he has become known for missing sitters. He's the new Murata, as some call him. But you don't win matches by simply having the most chances and the more dangerous chances. The team that scores the most goals does, and Rudiger finished in the 39th minute with a great header. Offside. But what I will say is that the disallowed goal opened the game up, got the crowd into it, made the game a little bit more stretched, which is... Not good for Germany, as we saw against Japan. You can hurt them in the wide areas in transition. Speaking of, in the second half, the new Morata, Ferran Torres, was subbed for the real thing, Alvaro Morata. And wouldn't you know it, Super Sub Morata provided a stunning, finesse little finish from a great ball from wide and the left. Two highly memed players, two highly complained about players getting it done for Spain. They looked quite nice on the counter. Yes, Germany had some chances. Here's looking at Musiala, who probably should have scored the ball for a sure thing goal, but you can't fault him for trying. Easier said than done. And if he had finished it off, we wouldn't be talking about that. We'd be talking about his brilliance. Germany did look a lot better with Sané on the pitch, as he and Musiala could combine nicely the two Bayern guys. And perhaps if Sané was healthier coming into this tournament, he would have started against Spain. But it was his fellow substitute, Nicholas Fulkrug, who got the equalizer for Germany. A nice touch from Musiala. And the Werder Bremen man was right there to steal it off of his boot and blast it past Simon. The kind of finisher that Germany had been missing for a while now. 1-1, Germany are still alive in this tournament because of that equalizer. Spain, for my money, 
should have put this game away and ended Germany's tournament earlier in the match as they had the chances to do so. As Germany, again, they're lacking in potency in front of goal when Fulkrug isn't on and when Sané isn't on, and their fullbacks are there for the taking. Kerrer and Raum ain't it, and the wide areas are where you can hurt Germany in transition. But with Sané coming on, suddenly Germany looked far more dangerous. He and Fulkrug must start in their final match against Costa Rica for my money. 1-1 the final here meaning Germany are still alive. They face Costa Rica, as mentioned, while Spain will be playing against Japan, and everyone in this group is still alive. This should be an incredible ending to this group. Morocco versus Belgium. Morocco looks sharp, but lacking in danger in the final third from their striker. Sure, the wing play from Hakimi and Ziyech was nice, but Enesiri wasn't doing enough to trouble Croatia's back line in the first match. Belgium, they were completely outplayed by Canada, perhaps were lucky with some calls in their own box, depending on who you ask, and really had a point to prove in this tournament despite winning their opening fixture. They had to prove that they're here to play. To Martinez's credit, I did like that he made a change in starting Onana in the midfield. He's going to miss their third match. He got a yellow. As he was a difference maker against Canada in the second half. Mounier and Torgan Hazard also started as the wing backs, with Castain dropping into that back three. Interesting changes from Martinez, who quite clearly... I mean, there can be no way he was happy with the performance from that first match, right? As for Morocco, Yassine Bono was in the lineup for the national anthems. He was singing away. And then he didn't start in goal. He was not in the team photo. Apparently, there was no announcement in the stadium either about the change. All a bit strange, wasn't it? Anyway, the 14th first half of 26 matches went goalless. Goals in the first half have been certainly hard to come by. No, just 12 games out of 26 with a goal in the first half at that point. There wasn't much to speak of, really, as Belgium struggled to generate chances. Same could be said of Morocco, who put the ball in the goal from a Ziyech free kick, but Roman Saiz was offside and absolutely affected the play with his attempted header, so it was rightly called back. Both of these sides struggled to generate chances in the box. All of the opportunities were coming from strike from outside of the box. After 70 minutes, the respective XGs were 0.68 Belgium, 0.23 for Morocco. Another slow one, but it got better in the second half. The goal from this match came directly from a free kick, directly from a free kick. Almost an Olympico with the placement of it. Sabiri with a free kick to the near post that caught Courtois sleeping. If you're Moroccan, it's a brilliant goal. The nerve to try to score from that angle against one of the best keepers in the world, etc. If you're Belgian, wholly underwhelming way to concede. Should never be conceding a goal like that. But Morocco deserved to be leading. They were the better team as Belgium were once again outplayed and offering little going forward. Leading Martinez to sub out Mounier for Lukaku to try to save this result. Lukaku questions over about how ready he is. But later, Morocco got a second. They absolutely deserved it as Hakim Ziyech cooked down the right, took on man after man, then rolled the ball inside to Abu Kal, and his finish into the top corner was an absolute beauty. Game over for Belgium, 2-0 Morocco, and good value for that result as well. Ziyech is balling out of his mind at the moment. Haven't seen a performance from him like this since the Ajax days. And you can see how important it was that Morocco got him back into the national team at the expense of their former manager. Ziyech and Sofiane Amrabat, huge performances from those two and a deserved win for Morocco. And then we had Canada versus Croatia. Canada coming into this off of their match against Belgium that they should have won. Well, Croatia were held by the tricky, tricky Moroccan side, but still for me, were the best team in this group. I had them finishing ahead of Belgium ahead of this tournament. However, like I always say, it's the hope that kills you. And that hope came from this moment. Here's Tejon Buchanan on the ball, goes for the far post. Davies! Goal! Canada's first goal at the World Cup! Let's go! Which for me, this moment alone, Canada's first ever goal at a World Cup makes up for the loss. This was a high I haven't felt in a long time when it comes to football. Though Benfica are coming close these days under Roger. Let's see how far they go in the Champions League. But this moment makes up for the heavy loss. Finally seeing my country at a World Cup. Finally seeing them score a goal. And of course it was Alfonso Davies. Croatia were a bit shell-shocked, but as they started to gain their footing in this match as time went on, there was only ever one outcome. Canada's midfield was completely overrun 
by that midfield three, a world-class midfield three of Modric, Kovacic, and Brozovic. While Canada's back line was looking incredibly poor. I love Alistair Johnson as a right back. I love Vitoria and Miller in a back four. But when it comes to a back line coming up against a team that was a finalist in 2018 and finished ahead of Denmark and France in their Nations League group while adding talented youth to their core of class experience, it's a whole other level. And they started picking their way through our midfield and back line way too easily. For Canada, Jonathan David is yet to arrive at this World Cup as our attack was essentially just Davies and Buchanan while David and Laren were on the pitch. Who, by the way, I love Buchanan as a winger, not as a wing back, though he's serviceable there. I'd love to see a 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1 where Davies and Buchanan can play as out and out wingers against Morocco in the next match. Croatia, all credit to them. The best team in this group by far, and I hope they have another deep run. Canada, they're eliminated, but this tournament always just provided experience ahead of 2026, when Canada will be four years further into their development, have four years more experience for a lot of players who are gonna be moving across to Europe. They're gonna be much better. Croatia are rightfully top of this group at the moment with that big win over Canada, with Morocco on equal points. Morocco will face Canada in what is a dead rubber for Canada, who is out, but Morocco could use a result depending on how Croatia versus Belgium goes. I would assume based on play so far that Croatia would win. And there you have it guys, another day in the books as these groups are really starting to take shape but are still pretty open as well. Most groups are going to the final match day, which you love to see. Thank you once again for joining me. I appreciate you and hope to see you around here again tomorrow. Be well.